Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. I'm Eric Roch. I'm a principal architect with Proficient. I lead a group called IT Modernization. My name is John Genda. I lead an integration team for TCF Bank. So a little bit about Proficient. We're a, a, a IT consulting digital agency, offices across the U.S., as you can see, and uh, offices overseas, mostly development centers. And we are a CA partner, award-winning partner. We just won an award yesterday, in fact. So been working with CA a number of years in, in the API space. So TCF Bank is a mid-size regional bank. We're based out of Minnesota and we have 376 branches. One of the nice things about being a mid-size bank is that gives us the ability to be more nimble than some of our larger competitors. And what we really want to do is meet the needs of our very specific customer base, be relevant, and make sure that we're wherever they want to be, whenever they want to be, and we want to be one TCF in rhythm with our customers. We realized a few years ago that we were, um, I don't want to say necessarily missing the boat, but a lot of our systems were a little bit long in the tooth. So one of the things that I want to specifically call out is courage and leadership. So our leaders recognized that we needed to make a change. We needed to come up with something dynamic and something interesting. So we decided to invest heavily in reinvigorating our entire IT infrastructure. And we chose to do so with the most modern of implementations and a very enterprise class, enterprise ready API ecostructure. So our business drivers in making this change, um, obviously some of our larger competitors had a more compelling mobile experience, um, the ability to deposit uh, via a mobile phone by taking a picture of the check. Uh, they had more responsive websites, faster performance, more functionality, things like peer-to-peer -peer payments and things like that you'll find at some of our larger competitors. So in order to drive these kinds of innovations, we needed to come up with a new paradigm, a new way of delivering on our API initiative. So. Historically, what we were striving against was is we had a little bit more of a buy shop mentality. Many of the things that we were running was we purchased a license. We may have had the source code. We may have done minor modifications to it. But largely, it was run what you bought. Um, some of the data or the majority of the data was locked up in a mainframe. So that made getting in and out of that uh, data source a little bit slower than we would like it to be and a little bit more difficult to integrate with. Um, there were problems with scalability, there were problems with high availability. What we found is isolated pockets of, well, everything's HA except for this one system. And, you know, you'd find reasons like, well, two systems that were supposed to be HA partners were sharing the same piece of network infrastructure or the same uh, disk resource. So what that would do is that would lead to a realization that you weren't as highly available as you intended. Um, some of the visibility into our services and whether or not they were healthy and whether or not they were functioning was lacking. And we didn't have much in the way of automation. So when we made code changes, it was very high risk, uh, very long lead times, um, a lot of difficulty getting those into production and tested successfully. So these are challenges that many industries face. Um, what we're going to describe today is a way to move away from some of those challenges into a much more sustainable way of uh, doing business. Okay, so I, I want to just talk in general about uh, microservices and APIs a bit. So I've been in this space and in integration since we've been talking about that since the 90s, so a long time. And uh, if you look at, I like to look at what are the overall goals that, that these different iterations that we've went through in integration. So SOA was all about reuse and it got to be somewhat cumbersome because people were thinking more about how to build things than how to use it really. And it, it wasn't that reusable. And in fact, uh, especially when you got to mobile devices, the uh, web services got to be kind of heavy and, and cumbersome and mobile devices were looking for something simpler. Uh, APIs, we really started to care about the developer experience and the, on the consuming side of them. So we started building API portals, for example, simplifying things in the REST kind of format, those things. So uh, that's one thing. And, and as you keep adding new things to it, I like to talk about the architectural goals, is that you kind of come under more constraints. So microservice is a good example. Microservice come about, really, you have APIs, you want them to be reusable, 
but you also want them to be scalable. You want them to, uh, to be able to very quickly change them, so agile and that sort of thing. And it introduces some more complexities. And these complexities are the kind of the challenges we're going to talk about to adopting this technology. So if you think that a monolithic application, but one big piece of code you deployed and managed and you could, you could, uh, you knew the servers, you could monitor it all together and things like that. And moving to something that's highly distributed, for example, TCF was running mainframes and of course some distributed systems, but moving from mainframes and then moving into a highly distributed environment, well, how do you test it? How do you deploy it? How do I uh, share data, which is a big deal? So, so get the mainframe data, which still has a lot of code on it, and then share it back down to the, to the distributed systems. So all these complexities is what we, we have to manage through, and it's kind of like a journey. Uh, one thing that we look at then is, is how do we disorganize for success? So it, from the organizational structure that's going to support it, also the planning activities that you're going to do. So how to, for example, I talk about the different kind of dependencies or requirements for microservices like monitoring and being agile and, and, uh, and being able to quickly deploy things. Well, how do I mature that, things like DevOps, uh, through this whole migration process? So. Uh, you look at the, the whole roadmap is, and then the organi stru organizational structure that's going to support it. Where integration in the past, for example, had a center for excellence where people would typically build a lot of things and you had to funnel things into that group to get something built. That's very difficult to do if you've got a two-week sprint that needs an API. You have to kind of move more to a, like a... a a self-service model. So I build an API, onboarding into the system, multiple people can use it in a very efficient way. The other things that you need, you really want your APIs to be kind of have standardized, kind of like what you think about a website having a style guide. You want your APIs to be similar, that, that you're following a guide, your, your error codes are the same, the way you use HTTP verbs are the same, the way you re name resources is, is similar. If you look at any of the, the uh, popular, you know, like Google APIs or PayPal APIs or e eBay APIs, they have like this style guide, this uh, approach that you define. And so that's, that's important. You, you, and you want to get people into this idea that when you build an API, it's like a product. You're packaging it up, making it really easy to consume, those approaches. And, and uh, these standard and guidelines, what you really want is things to, to be very efficient. So we, we th have things like KPIs, how do I measure it? Like for example, a KPI around usage, who's using it? Are people using the portal? How many people are using this API? And then look at the whole flow. This flow here is like onboarding an API. So I want to make sure when I onboard a new API onto an API management system like, like CA, uh, the CA API management platform, that I get all of the artifacts with it that I'm, that I'm describing, like a Swagger document and, and uh, example code and things like that with it, and versioning the, the, the API and securing the API, those things. So this brings us into, and I want to cover this, we, th those are some approaches for the APIs. There's also a number of challenges, and let's walk through this. And what I'm going to do is, is how, how TCF handled that challenge, for example. So one is, it's just kind of a long road, and, and there's, as, as I mentioned, there's a lot of things to change. So the operational aspect of it, but also the development side of it, so how do I be more agile? And, and the business might not be, uh, know how to be agile as well, so working with the big business to be more agile, working with operations to be more DevOps kind of style. So since this is kind of a long journey, we always look for things that, one is you plan it out like a roadmap and, and have different tracks to, to mature, but also how do we uh, achieve value as you're going through it? So, you know, if, as you build certain things, then you, you pick up value along the way, so you're not just waiting to the very end, for example, to get that value. And uh, let John talk about how TCF did it. So, like I said before, step one is the realization that you need to do it. Step two is the courage to actually take the first step along that path. Uh, one of the things that we found a great deal of value in was partnering with the Trailblazer. One of the things that Proficient has been able to do for us is they've been able to share other companies' approaches, other companies' successes, and it really gives you almost an unfair advantage, a head start, in that you already know most of the things not to do. So you can start by doing the things that make the most sense. So how we began our, our journey was is that, well, first of all, we had to stop being waterfall, stop being 
um, analysis paralysis. You know, because we're a bank and we're conservative, a lot of what we like to do is we like to really plan things completely out and make sure that we have a schedule and all the alignment and all that kind of stuff. Well, that leads to very long lead times and honestly, even if you have the greatest plan, no plan ever survives contact with the enemy. Two or three months later, you find out everything's changed, we gotta go back to the drawing board. So really, make small, incremental improvements, test them out, make sure they work. If they fail, you fail fast so that you can immediately start over again and do it the right way this time. So we embraced agile development, we embraced Scrum, we brought in uh, a lot of new talent because some of our existing talent just didn't quite have what it took to move into this you know, open source, agile, Java, Spring Boot, Apache Camel based world, which is what we built on our APIs on. So once we decided what we were gonna do, we had to build up pipelines, CICD. Uh, right now we've got a huge pipeline where we can automatically build, automatically test, automatically deploy, uh, store binaries in a secure way so that we can redeploy, fail forward, fail back, do anything we need to be able to do in order to support our production systems. So all of this stuff had to be stood up almost while we were doing it. Um, some of it had to come first, but a lot of it has been a journey as we've been moving forward. So again, some of the things that we learned from Proficient really helped us get a head start on all that. And then we just basically got started and started running. Thanks. So the next one is that, that technical foundation. And you spoke a little bit to it, but if you look at a lot of products, so if you look at even the CICD and the, and the developer and collaborative development, things like GitHub and, and the uh, developer collaboration, the tool chain, I mean, that's one aspect of it, but we also look at like NoSQL and mainframe integration and all of those things. So how do you go about putting that technology foundation together? So we re really looked at things like reference architectures and guidelines for developers, the proof of technology, those kind of things to uh, help the developers along. So let John speak to this some more. And one of the things that was really helpful is Together with Proficient and also leveraging some of the experience by the new talent that we brought on board, we were able to envision a way to move forward. Because a lot of times you find yourself with, this problem is too complicated, it's too difficult. Um, what we were able to do is break that down into small pieces. So if, if you have just a sec, we had a mainframe, which was our source of truth. And then we had some modern customer out here, let's call it a mobile application that wants to look up a customer. Um, Modern application really can't talk directly to the mainframe, so you need something in the middle. So what we did is we took our mainframe, this was the roadmap that we had, it's like fine, if we have our mainframe, Informatica CDC on the mainframe, ActiveMQ as a buffer, Cassandra data stacks as an ODS, and then an API server on top of that, and then CA API gateway to allow us to manage those APIs. So that was the vision. Once we had that laid out, then it becomes very tactical. All right, let's go ahead and get the Informatica piece taken care of so that we can get the data out of the mainframe. Let's go ahead and get the Cassandra piece taken care of, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So with each of these building blocks, it may seem really complicated, but the nice thing about having all these building blocks separated out is one can be swapped at will. I'll give you an example. Uh, we chose ActiveMQ is kind of a buffer between the mainframe and our Cassandra database, we can easily swap that out with a brand new technology that's just emerging called Kafka, which gives us neat capabilities on top of what your typical uh, JMS message queue would give you. So the other one is the integration difficulty. So that, as I showed in the picture earlier, these microservices really have to have their own data store, for example. They have to communicate against each other. And then, you've, in this case, there's the mainframe aspect of it, so that has to be integrated. So really, we, we wanted to build, and did build a reference architecture that included things like ETL and, and ESB, and then mainframe integration, change data capture, it was a whole kind of integration strategy around it. Then you have to also be concerned about, well, which pieces of a kind of the monolith are you gonna carve out to run somewhere else, and then you have to communicate back with that monolith again. So it's, it's fairly complicated and you really need a good strategy. Obviously care about things like data quality and you know, in a bank, not losing transactions, those kind of things. So once we had our roadmap set out, how we knew we wanted to get there, um, to be honest, and you've heard people say this before, writing an API, the actual mechanics of an API is not very complicated. 
It is a web service call. Um, we used to call them web services. We call them APIs now. But essentially, REST JSON, it's got a number of fields. It's got a signature. It gets called with a value. And it returns a result. At its very core, an API by itself is simple. Now, where it gets complicated is the fact that we need to integrate this with something. It's, it's great. I can put a mock on the end of my API and I can call it all day long. I can, you know, and just give it garbage data. It'll give me garbage data back. What we really needed to do, though, is ferret out something very specific that was stored in the mainframe. Let's, um, and my best example is, is that let's say I'm in a branch and I talk to a teller and they enter something in on a green screen and then let's say it's a change of record, uh, customer address. And then as the customer is walking out the door, they look at it on their mobile phone to make sure that it really got changed. You need it to be that fast and you need it to be absolutely correct. Otherwise the customer is gonna stop, get back in line and it's gonna be a difficult conversation at that point. So defining the API, we use Swagger for that. It's a neat tool. Um, if you haven't heard of it, it's w definitely worth the look. It'll automatically generate code inside of Spring Boot. So it's a really neat way to get started with your API initiative. Then what we needed to do is we needed to decide what is an API. And this is worth discussing just for a moment because sometimes a point-to-point -point integration is masquerading as an API. And the question you can ask yourself is this, can my API be used by any other application in my bank? So for instance, we have some customer facing stuff, we have some teller facing stuff, we have some back end office facing stuff. So if I've created an API that only one of those guys can use, and an example might be because there's some sort of a key piece of information they need to use to call the API to get the correct response. If all three of those applications can't use my API, then it's not an enterprise class reusable high-speed API. You have created a point-to-point -point integration. Now, you may have created a point-to-point -point integration with JSON and Swagger, but it didn't necessarily move the needle. What APIs do is they give you the ability to massively reuse that API. So when you think about an API, um, you can get stuck into a, well, the guy that I'm talking to just wants first name, last name, and the street address. I'm not even gonna ask why. That's all they wanted, that's all I'm gonna give them. Well, the next guy needed the state, the zip code, and perhaps an SSN out of that same API call. So you have to think more broadly. That's one of the key things that I can you know, offer as our experience is that when you're thinking about APIs, make sure that they're broad, make sure that they're reusable, and make sure that um, you're not doing point-to-point -point integrations. Now, the next thing, once you've got an enterprise class high-speed API, the CA API gateway and the CA API developer portal were key pieces of our ability to socialize and manage those APIs. So we get all sorts of neat security features, we get all sorts of neat um, routing features, we can take care of all the aspects of management of the actual API. But if you can't tell your audience, all of your other interested developers, and right now, you know, that's hundreds. If you can't somehow communicate to them, I've got an API that you could call that allows you to change a customer's address, it's never gonna get used. Or you're gonna have to do a very difficult walking to people one at a time and say, hey, have you heard of this? So the portal is a great tool. Um, one of the other things it does, if you haven't heard about it, it'll allow you to download sample code. So if you're actually browsing the portal, you can get access to it with an OAuth token and you can actually download sample code that your developer can now take, put into his IDE and C Sharp and Java and Python, and he can immediately get going on that. And I can't, I can't say enough how neat a product that is. Right, that's a great example too about the criticality of the data and the data quality. So if you've got a mobile application and people are carrying it around with it, for example, they go on the branch or if you're a retailer and you go into the retail location and it says for you know, if a retailer, if the product's on the shelf and it this, costs this much and it's not on the shelf or it doesn't cost that, cost that much, then it's a bad customer experience. Or if you walk into the branch in your case, make a withdrawal, you walk out and you look and it's not there, or a deposit and it's not there, that's the criticality of the data and the, 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 the need for that integration strategy. It's a good point. So let's talk about getting started. We talked about a roadmap and the roadmap really needs to encompass these multiple tracks. So 
uh, again, it's back to this prerequisites of doing microservices. So to do microservices, you really need the concept of, of DevOps. So you, you're distributing the applications, so they have to be monitored. The developer really needs to understand the behavior of the system. So are people using it? So you need feedback loops. You also need to understand the capacity. Do I need to start more microservices? Do I need to split this one apart, apart because it's too coarse grained? Those kind of things, the developer really needs to understand the behavior of it. You need to be agile because the whole point, of, uh, there's two points really to the micro, the, at, a, at a very high level of a microservice. You want to be able to deliver things very fast. So if you're not agile, it, you, you, it doesn't matter. I mean, you're going through a lot of extra work and you're not getting the benefit. The other one is you want to be resilient and, and, and that goes back to the DevOps. Now. So the other side of the DevOps, if you're agile and you can build something in two weeks, but it takes you four weeks to deploy it, then you've, then you're, you've defeated the purpose of it. So you have to worry about all those things. So, so things, and what, what we did in the case of all of our customers, but specific at TCF, is you look at where are the gaps. So are you agile now? If you're not agile, how do, how do you become more agile? So maybe agile coaching, maybe just going through the ceremonies like a, you know, the, the stand-ups and retrospects and things like that and starting to get a feel for it and helping the business understand they don't have to shove everything into one release, which is always a challenge. They want everything in and, and that's the way they've always done things. So it's a challenge. And then the other side is the te technology adoption. So how do I... Uh, adopt this new technology when I've got maybe a bunch of COBOL programmers and now I need to be Java Spring Boot and, and those technologies is, is a, certainly a challenge. So you need a lot, you need standards, you need guidance, you need things like a proof of technology and sample code, uh, you, you know, those, those kind of things. Uh, here at Innovation Lab, so how do I start it in a lab and then grow it and, 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 and spread it out in the different parts of the country, I mean the company. So we'll talk about your roadmap. So level one, level two, level three, I kind of like to think about this as initial adoption, maturing and thriving. Where we all want to get is we wanted to get to the point where we got this. Um, it's going to take a little bit of time to get there. Uh, the business can be fragmented. You know, you end up getting siloed, especially when you're talking about different products, different product offerings. There can sometimes be reasons where one business unit can't be part of another business unit, regulatory reasons, things like that. So one of the things that you have to do is you have to communicate effectively with all of your business functions, your business leaders. Um, you have to understand what it is that we're trying to do and who do we need to coordinate with in order to do that. APIs, um, talked about those before. Start small, start very specific. Um, when I say very specific, a general purpose specific API. You don't want to come up with an API. We have an example of an API that I think will accept 137 different possible parameters. That's probably not, that, that, that's a legacy one. That's probably not a good model to follow. Um, our new APIs are very specific. Look up a customer by ID, look up a customer by first name and last name, things like that. Um, so once we've got the APIs identified and we start to deliver them, then we can iterate on that and um, once we've got the roadmap laid out, we can just start to accelerate our process on delivering more and more APIs. Data, data is kind of interesting. We chose Cassandra data stacks because we wanted fast access to our data. So in a typical mainframe environment, we would have latencies in the neighborhood of 200 to 600 milliseconds, somewhere in that neighborhood. We would sometimes have suspiciously long spikes that we didn't have any control of, um, 10 seconds. You know, it's like, what just happened? But it won't re re you couldn't repeat it. It would just be kind of an intermittent thing. By using Cassandra data stacks as a fast cache in the middle of our architecture, we've got our response times down to nine milliseconds, which is just outstanding. We can do that in a sustained performance test all day long. And it's being able to deliver those kinds of results with your APIs that's really gonna move the needle and it's really gonna convince people that this is the right approach. One of the other things we can do is we can scale out infinitely, either via containers or virtual machines or however your particular infrastructure is set up. Um, because of the open source technologies we're using, we can stand up as many new instances of it as we want and we don't incur a lot of additional license costs and things like that. So that makes it really easy to scale up. Uh, CI, CD, going from manual to automated. Um, 
One of the nice things that we're doing with CICD that I want to touch on is not only do we want to automatically build, we want to automatically test, we want to fail a build and alert people if that automated test fails, and then when we deploy to a server, we don't want to just deploy our code to the server, we want to have our CICD be robust enough to actually take bare metal and bring it all the way to a functioning machine, whether that's a container, a virtual machine, or a physical box. We want to be able to bring all of the stuff up, so if it needs a certain component to be installed, our deployment script will check for that. If it's not there, it'll put it on. Um, and if it somehow gets removed, which we've seen a few times, it'll put it back. Um, and then infrastructure, we're, we're, um, we're experiencing a little bit of a revolution in infrastructure. We had a lot of physical. Then we moved to virtual. Now we're um, seriously talking about going to the cloud. There's a lot of discussions we're having, which cloud provider, whether we go containers, um, whether we go you know, a private cloud on-prem or whether we go a full public cloud. So these are all things that are part of our journey. We're not quite to the mature phase there, but we're well on our way. Okay. So um, one of the really interesting things that we touched on earlier was how do you get started? And this is sometimes overwhelming for most customers. Uh, I want to go to APIs. I don't want to do a complete big bang. In fact, I can't. Nobody will let me. They're not going to let me take three years and then, ha-ha, everything's done. What we found was very, very valuable was to do a proof of technology, POT, POC. Uh, what we set up was all of these technologies in a very limited use environment just to prove everything out. Once we, pro once we proved all these technologies in a small proof of technology, we were able to sell it to our leadership, prove that it worked, and then go ahead and implement it for real. And honestly, implementing it for real was more or less a copy from our proof of technology into our production. It was that easy. So the technologies that we used, Apache Camel, that's just a integration layer for everything that we want to do. We can set up JSON web services, things like that. Um, all the rest of these, the CA API management, uh, GitHub for source control, Jenkins for CI CD. Um, you know, Spring Boot is what we actually use to write our Apache Camel code manually. Uh, Java, of course, and then you know, all the other usual suspects. One of the things I'll touch on just in closing is logging and uh, monitoring those logs can't be, under, can't be overstated. So right now we've got Splunk that's actually capturing all these logs for us. And the right balance to strike there is, is you want it to be alerting you of real problems, but you don't want to be overwhelmed by the noise. You know, if you're getting 20 or 30,000 alerts in your email box because of some reason, that's probably not using log alerting correctly. So you can strike a right balance there and it can be very powerful. We automatically open ServiceNow tickets, you know, P1 or P2. Um, all that is driven by our logs, um, which is really powerful. And then obviously there's a lot of learning, a lot of standards, a lot of things that you need to do along the way, and it is absolutely a journey, but um, it's, a, it's an it's effective one. One of the really impressive things is you look at this long list of software, uh, the decisions in the stand-up was about three months at firm. I know I was working there. Uh, I've worked with customers that take longer than a year to make like an ESB decision. So you, it, it, you can't be agile and make, if you think add it up and it took, takes even a month to make a decision on any of this software, it would have been a year to, to, make, the, well, just it, to make the software decision. So, and it doesn't help that there's three competitors for everything on this line. Right. So you get into analysis paralysis. So another key point is to pick a technology that is reasonably good, reasonably robust, and reasonably supported, and go with it. Um, you could spend forever trying to decide which one is the best one. Six months later, you'll be asking the question, did I choose the right one? Um, reasonably good and good enough will get you where you need to go. And then, the, then test it in the POT is exactly yep. what. So you want to. So the what's outcome. the outcome? We're currently delivering high-speed APIs. Um, we were able to do so in under a year, and that is from on the back of a napkin to completely deployed into production with our brand new mobile application and our brand new digital website using it. Um, we were able to modernize all of our IT platforms and process. We were able to spin up an entire CI CD pipeline. We were able to revolutionize our entire way we wrote software from waterfall to agile. We did all of that in under a year and that's just an exceptional result. And Proficient was a huge part of that, as was CA, API Gateway, and their portal technology. So then, uh, just one closing slide. It's this idea of setting up an, an innovation lab or this proof of technology, looking at candidate architectures, doing the proof of technology, setting up your reference architecture, your standards, and things like that. I mean, then you can go very fast.
Unfortunately, we need to take questions over on the side because we're really out of time. Uh, this is a lot, of, lot to cover in 30 minutes. But we'll step over here and... Uh, Be delighted take, to take any questions anyone might have. Lots right. more to share. Then I think we need to close out. Thank you.